Okay, this is just a test for the mic. And uh, welcome everyone to our health system transformation webinar, Making Interprofessional Teams Shine. We have a panel in front of you that you can, hopefully you can see. So we just wanna make sure that you can see with your camera and that you can hear us loud and clear. If you hover at the bottom of your screen, you'll see some uh, menu bar that pops up and you have the opportunity to write in the chat box. So we encourage you, if you have any comments, to write them in the chat box throughout the webinar, and we'll be monitoring that and bringing your questions and comments uh, forward. So we'll begin in just a moment, and I'd just like to hear from one, at least one person in the chat box if you can hear us loud and clear and can see. And I've got a thumbs up from Olivia, who's behind the scenes here, who is making sure that the tech is working. So I think, Doris, I can hand it over to you to get us started. Very good. So, um, good afternoon again, and thank you very much uh, for joining us. I actually wouldn't mind at all if those of you that are in the webinar can send to Olivia. Uh, yes, I was in previous uh, webinars, or this is my first. So just say first, or have been in previous one, just to have a baseline of the information that colleagues uh, have about the uh, health system transformation in Ontario. And with that, uh, let me first introduce you to what we plan to do today. Uh, I don't have the clicker, uh, but here we have the names there, so that's very helpful. So we will be sharing uh, the latest updates about the health system transformation and specifically about OHTs. I will be speaking uh, a little bit and then I will pass it on to Phil Graham, who is the executive lead at the Ontario Health Team. And I am very privileged to know Phil for uh, some time, many years, and have been impressed, especially in his previous portfolio, uh, with this understanding and expertise on primary care, which for those of you that know RNO uh, and know some of the models we have put forward like ECHO in 2.12 and ECHO again in 2.14, you know that we believe that any effective health system needs to be anchored in primary care. So we are particularly thrilled that Phil is in, that, in the portfolio of Ontario Health Teams now and brings that expertise about primary care. Um, Phil will be sharing uh, as much as he can today. Today was an announcement of, uh, by the minister and I had the privilege of being there uh, about the next steps for the OHT. So Phil will share as much as he can. And then of course, uh, I will be giving my own interpretations on what he cannot share. Here you go. Uh, because I happen to be here surrounded by colleagues from one of the OHTs who will be presenting uh, after Phil and I present, which is the East Toronto Health Partners BPSO OHT. And we will let you know what this BPSO OHT is all about because it's part of the OHT model and not all the OHTs have this. So with that in mind, uh, let me pass it on first, uh, if we can just pass the slides, uh, to Phil Graham. Just while the slides are getting set up, uh, thank you, Doris, and thanks to the uh, uh, RNAO for hosting this event um, and uh, allowing me to speak about uh, Ontario health teams and what they're about and uh, where we're at in uh, this journey. Um, it's a very important initiative. Uh, I think for those who are part of the session today, uh, I think you probably in practice and in the work that you do day in, day out, see pretty significant gaps in our healthcare system, um, gaps in patients going from provider to provider, from setting to setting. And uh, I think what we're trying to make Ontario health teams about is a way in which to address some of those issues in a manner that's very much informed by people like yourselves who work every day and see the, the problems in our healthcare system and where it's not serving patients to the extent that it can. 
uh, as well as informed by patients, people with lived experience, caregivers, and the communities in which they live to make sure that local solutions are brought to bear on some of the challenges that we see. So, uh, so thanks again for having me here. So I have a few slides because uh, I work for the government. We don't go anywhere without uh, slides and uh, fancy um, or try to be fancy slide presentations. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, is walk you through uh, some background around what Ontario health teams uh, are, uh, what are some of the goals that are driving the creation of Ontario health teams, uh, as well as where we are in the, in the process. And I do look forward to colleagues from uh, the East Toronto Collaborative uh, because I think that's a really good example of uh, the real work that's happening in communities across the province and bringing the concept of Ontario health teams uh, to life. Um, so I'll start off with uh, the case for change. And sorry, there's a lot of a lot of words here, um, but I think we know, and we know from both uh, lived experience as well as through. Uh, you know, reports and research that we have a pretty darn good healthcare system in Ontario, uh, much of which is because of the hardworking healthcare providers that day in, day out are making our healthcare system work for patients. Um, but we know that over time that the demands upon us uh, by an aging population with increasing complex health needs um, that the system is not doing all it can for those uh, particular patients as well as others. Uh, the silos that we have around different parts of our healthcare system, the way in which we fund healthcare, the way in which rules are established for healthcare providers are all done or have been done in, in various silos over time. And whereas that uh, may have seemed like a good, good, good approach uh, administratively, as new models of care evolved and as new rules were put into place, what we're seeing is that those silos are actually having a negative impact on the journey that patients are, ha are, are making through the healthcare system. And so we see uh, fracturation happening, we see disconnections happening, and nurses who are on the front line probably are seeing this most acutely uh, every day. Um, and so really the genesis of Ontario health teams is a way in which to address some of these challenges, to, to provide uh, uh, connections between the different providers in a patient's healthcare journey uh, that are informed by patient experience, by local realities and by community need. Um, and uh, really the approach is not just tackling one part of the journey, so hospitals to home care or primary care to hospitals. It's really a comprehensive approach to look at the full journey that many patients have in the healthcare system and their full experience and try to improve it in a more comprehensive way. Uh, during this process, during the change process, which I'll get into in a, in a couple of slides, the continuity of patient care remains top priority. And we've been pretty deliberate through uh, the Ontario Health Teams Initiative, as well as other uh, significant changes that are occurring in our healthcare system today to make sure that that care to the individual patient, that their choice of provider is not disrupted as we go through this process. So um, the next slide is really about the vision for integrated care. And, and um, we, we think a lot about strategy and vision in the ministry as a way to guide some of the activities that uh, are being rolled out provincially and that are being supported locally. Um, so one, one element of the vision for integrated care is uh, really organizing healthcare providers to work as one coordinated team, uh, focusing on patients and local needs. I think that's a vision that probably nurses in the audience can very much appreciate and resonate with. I would say that uh, in my experience in primary care, working with community health centers, family health teams, nurse practitioner led clinics, Aboriginal health access centers, and many other models, nurses are very much at the vanguard of team based care and always have been. And so that visioning around organizing healthcare providers around uh, a common uh, goal of improving patient care and helping patients navigate the system, I think is one that is, is very close uh, to many of you in the audience. Um, another element that is, is related to Ontario health teams, but in a different way, is combining the multiple provincial health agencies 
into one agency called Ontario Health. And there have been some recent announcements around that. That is very much at a provincial level, a way of trying to streamline oversight, have a lot more clarity for healthcare providers around um, the oversight agency that is in, in, in the healthcare space. Um, whereas Ontario health teams are very much uh, local grassroots organized. Uh, a third element is improving access to secure digital tools, including online access to health records and more options for patients to benefit from virtual care. There are some pockets of amazing excellence of the use of technology to improve how people and patients experience their healthcare system. But unfortunately, they are that just that. They're localized pockets of excellence. And I think it's safe to say that in Ontario, we fell somewhat behind in broad-based adoption of virtual and digital tools, uh, particularly those that are patient facing. And we have some work to do in that regard. And the fourth is uh, about supply chain efficiencies and the government in another area are, are really looking at a more modern way of, uh, you know, trying to get more dollars out of the administrative work involved in procurement, uh, uh, or more dollars out of that and into uh, frontline services. So that's the general context and the sort, sort of four key priority areas that the government is, uh, has articulated and is working away at. Um, so the next, next slide gets into what I would argue is the most important of these four priorities, and, and this is uh, about Ontario Health Team. So this is really just an overview. Um, so in April of this year, uh, the government uh, uh, passed or uh, a very important piece of legislation received royal assent and that's called the People's Health Care Act. And really what this does, it's a piece of legislation that supports a lot of the transformation that plans that this government has identified uh, and the ones that are most appropriate to do through a legislative vehicle like the People's Health Care Act. Um, part of that act includes a statute called the Connecting Care Act, which establishes this concept of an Ontario health team. And in the legislation, it's actually called an integrated care delivery system, but the brand we're using is called Ontario Health Team. And, re and really what it does is it identifies it as an integrated model of service delivery intended to bring uh, providers from across the spectrum of care together into a single point of both clinical accountability and fiscal accountability. Um, now, over uh, working with Doris actually and her team over the many years, uh, we've been involved in several, I would say, experiments that, that try to integrate services the way that Ontario health teams do. Uh, some of you uh, in the audience may have been involved in Health Links, which was a model of uh, integrated service delivery for you know, patients in Ontario that have the most complex health, health needs. Um, we worked with the LINs on sub-region planning as a way of uh, bringing together in a geographic based model, a series of healthcare providers to look, take a population health based approach. Uh, this is different in many respects, one of which is that none of those had the power of legislation behind them. I would say that in my uh, tenure, this model is the one where uh, in legislation you have uh, a, a model defined uh, intentionally to bring services together under one roof and actually a mechanism for the Minister of Health to designate a group of providers as a single Ontario health team. So I would say it's a pretty big deal from that perspective when you know our representatives in the legislature vote on a bill that actually has this type of treatment of an integrated care model, whereas prior approaches to this, uh, we have not had that sort of gravitas. Um, and so we love the, our, our current state and our future state diagrams, which you can see on this slide. I think as I described at the onset, the current state, we have some really hardworking healthcare providers like many of the nurses in the audience and physicians and nurse practitioners and social workers, uh, the list goes on. But there are some structural problems with how healthcare is organized that patients are starting to see as they traverse between their nurse in the primary care setting to their nurse and the provider in the hospital, back to home care, visiting specialists. And these cracks are getting wider and wider and are being seen by a broader number of patients as our population ages. Uh, and in the future state, we look at a much more connected system where through digital tools, 
through more seamless connections between provider groups and organizations that the, that the, the fact that there may be an H on one building and not on the other building almost appears invisible. And that's the goal for patients to deal with one healthcare team, uh, regardless of what organization they, 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 they work in and uh, are able to navigate through a system using technology and through appropriate supports and care coordination. Um, it's not gonna be easy to get there, but uh, that is the future state vision. Um, some, some specifics about the vision for Ontario health teams. Uh, one key point is this is, the government is putting a big commitment behind this. Uh, so one key, uh, key point is that at maturity, the vision is for every Ontarian to have access to an Ontario health team that will do a range of things. So one is, as I mentioned, is providing a full continuum of care for a population within a defined geographic area. This idea that if you live in Guelph or the District of Kenora or Sioux Lookout or Ottawa or all the spaces in between, that there is a, a team, an Ontario health team that is able to provide patients within that geography a full continuum of services ranging from primary care all the way through to discharge from hospital as well as additional services at either end and in between. The promise is to offer patients uh, 24 access to uh, the coordination of care and system navigation services, particularly those who need the most support. And from a lot of the uh, user research that we do, as well as the research done internationally about Ontario's healthcare system, we know that there are particular segments of the population that have really high health needs that are having to go between multiple different providers, having to explain their ailments over and over and over again, and they're not necessarily getting the best care as a result. And so part of the promise of Ontario Health Teams is additional and uh, support for patients to help with that coordination and navigation as they travel through the healthcare system. Uh, another commitment or element of the vision is about measurement. And I know the RNAO in particular has very much uh, promoted uh, measuring best practices as a way of demonstrating the value of whatever intervention it may be, and also enabling the spread and scale of those best practices. And you'll hear a bit more about that later on. Um, another element of the vision is, is for Ontario health teams to operate within a single clear accountability framework. And this uh, really gets at what I was uh, speaking to before about um, a single point of accountability where uh, a lot of the teams and organizations that are within a patient's journey fall under. So it's clear about what the goal is for that community, not a series of organizations within that community, and that there's accountability to achieve that goal. A related point is being funded through an integrated funding envelope. And this is probably one that we get the most questions about because it is quite different from funding regimes that we see today in our system. Uh, this whole idea that uh, every organization, and there's probably about three to 4,000 different organizations that are funded in the healthcare system in Ontario, and each has their own individual funding arrangement, each their own agreement, their own budget, their own governance arrangement, their own indicators and measurements, their own accountability, um, requirements and that is resulting in a lot of fracturation and, and barriers to get people working together and the vision I think it's going to take us a while to get here to be honest but the vision is to have a funding envelope that reflects the needs of patients that reside within a particular community not necessarily the needs of a particular organization and uh, we have some work to do to uh, deliver and arrive at what we call population-based funding models where, where communities receive a budget to care for a population. Um, uh, but that is uh, an element of the vision for Ontario health teams moving forward. Um, and the last two are about continuing to keep our focus on investment in frontline services and the work that nurses do and the work that social workers do and the work that our healthcare providers are doing in providing frontline care to patients as well as improving access to secure digital tools, including the digital tools that interact with patients. Um, uh, you know, the online scheduling, 
ways of interacting with providers uh, through virtual means in addition to the face-to-face -face interaction. So that is, that is sort of the suite of elements of our vision for Ontario Health Teams. I often describe it as a marathon, not a sprint. Some of these things are gonna take a while to come online and our commitment is to work with all the teams in Ontario that have demonstrated a commitment to move in this direction to make sure they're supported as we run this long race. Um, one of the, uh, Doris, as I said, and the RNAO have been big on measurement. The key measurement concept that we're using as we look to evaluate Ontario health teams during our progress is called the quadruple aim. And the quadruple aim is not an uncommon concept in healthcare delivery. It has its origins in, in the United States, but has very much been adopted internationally. And what the quadruple aim is, is it describes really the fundamental goals of any modern healthcare system. And those are listed on this slide here. So it starts with uh, the improved patient and caregiver experience and a way that we can measure that to evaluate and quantify how good we're doing in meeting the needs of, needs of patients and needing, meeting the needs of caregivers who play a fundamental role in our healthcare system as well. The second aim is improving health outcomes. And obviously this is why we're all here, um, including all the, the, nursing, the nurses on the line, is really taking people who are not doing well and making them better. Uh, and that's, also, that's about health. It's also about some of the things that determine someone's health, uh, such as the social supports and the family supports and the employment supports, uh, you name it. A third aim is reduce costs. And this is not about cutting costs, this is about reducing costs uh, to make sure that the investments that we are making are, 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 are being made in the right areas to support frontline services and not on the administrative work necessarily that has to go into that. And so there's smart ways to do it and, one, and the Ontario Health Team's approach is one way in which that is done but not an immediate thing. The whole idea is to show improvement in uh, health outcomes and experience and work-life uh, balance for providers, uh, as well as um, reducing administrative costs over, the, over that process. And then the fourth aim uh, that we have added in Ontario uh, and has been added uh, in other jurisdictions as well uh, uh, that is really based on the work that uh, Doris and the RNAO has done, as well as other associations representing uh, the interests of providers, is making sure that uh, the, the uh, quality of work life for healthcare providers is also measured as part of our goals here. We are hearing and learning about increased workload, increased stress, um, and uh, uh, uncertainty. And, and we need to acknowledge as part of any measurement framework uh, to include the work of uh, healthcare providers and evaluating the extent to which the system is serving your needs as well as those of patients and caregivers. And so these four key elements make up the quadruple aim and that will be the overarching measurement framework that we're using to evaluate uh, uh, our progress as we uh, uh, roll out Ontario health teams and support them towards maturity. So uh, I, I'm now going to turn to the practical matters about where we're at in this journey. Uh, uh, and so the next slide really identifies, I would say, a bit of a gating process that has been associated with the path to become an Ontario health team. And this has very much been uh, based on the advice of a range of healthcare organizations and providers of having this sort of gated approach uh, along the way uh, to make sure that um, everyone has an opportunity to become an Ontario health team, but also that those who are ultimately selected to become an Ontario health team go through a process uh, and are guided along that way. Um, so at first, it, it starts off with a self-assessment process where teams uh, at any point can identify uh, their interest in becoming Ontario Health Team and to provide the ministry with an assessment of where they're at relative to uh, the goals that have been established for the model. After the self-assessment, uh, there is a full application, which is a fairly intensive exercise. I think my colleagues uh, in the room here can likely attest that it's not a, has not been an easy process to 
uh, fulfill the requirements of the full application, uh, but many have done, and, uh, and uh, I've had the pleasure of reading all of them, uh, about 3,000 pages, a uh, bit weary today, but uh, it's been an amazing read, and so much work has gone into the full applications that have uh, been developed to date, uh, quite a, a significant undertaking. Uh, we also, as part of the, this process, uh, undertake community visits. Uh, so for the 31 full applications that were submitted uh, uh, in October, uh, each one of those uh, applicants, each one of those communities uh, received a community visit from um, uh, the ministry as well as our key partners in uh, Cancer Care Ontario, Health Quality Ontario, and, uh, and a range of others. And then the selection of teams. Uh, and so that's how the general gating process has worked, that we're in the first round of applying this. Uh, so we've kind of learned along the way as well as others. Um, and what this process helps to do is in some ways help identify where the various uh, prospective teams fall within a trajectory. And at the bottom of that slide is what the, the sort of categories that we've identified. And the key concept here is no is not an answer. Uh, to go back to the vision, uh, we expect over time that every Ontario will have an Ontario health team and be affiliated with an Ontario health team. And so if there's an interested party submitting their interest, uh, no is not an answer. It's really a matter of time and a matter of sequence. And so there are some applicators, some self-assessments that were put forward that needed a bit more work, a bit more time to refine their approach they were identified as in discovery. Some more discovery is needed for, you know, partners to sit around the table to truly identify what their goals are, uh, to truly identify how their activities can align with the Ontario health team model, and so on and so forth. Uh, there are also teams identified as in development, which means, uh, you know, they probably have the basics of what it takes to become a mature Ontario health team, but again, some key areas that probably require a bit more progress, a bit more work before advancing along the continuum. Um, and then you had uh, a full applicants and uh, we're in the process now uh, of uh, announcing the results of our evaluation of the full applicant uh, Ontario health teams with the first announcement that was made today. Um, so the next slide gives you a bit more detail about where we're at uh, currently. Um, one thing uh, I wanted to draw attention to is uh, in regards to that first step along the way, the submission of a, of a self-assessment, we had over 150 uh, different self-assessments uh, uh, submitted to the ministry uh, back in uh, May, um, uh, really, really after an announcement where the minister invited folk to put their name in a hat. We were not, we were expecting probably in the ballpark of 30 or 40 different self-assessments. And so when we got 150 submitted on the uh, deadline, uh, I have to say we were pleasantly su surprised, a bit freaked out because of the <laughs> volume that we weren't, uh, we weren't anticipating, but pleasantly surprised. And I think the message for us was that there there is so much appetite for change and so much enthusiasm to do something different. I think um, the additional work to review the 150 was small and piddly in comparison to, I think, the gratification we received of, of seeing such a strong appetite for changing how care is delivered and changing how work is coordinated. Um, and so where we're at today is, uh, uh, I'll, I'll bring you to the, to the map on the slide nine is this graphically shows uh, the 31 teams through that process that were invited to uh, submit a full application and the 41 teams that are kind of the, the next group in the pipeline that are uh, to become uh, full applicants uh, once a bit further refinement is made to their self-assessments. Um, and slide, the next slide details that a little bit more, which I think I've covered. Uh, one, uh, a couple of key points here. One is that the full applicant teams submitted October 9th, and we're in the process of, uh, our ministers in the process of announcing the selected groups. Uh, it's being done 
uh, in a sort of holiday 12 days of Christmas for those who celebrate or another similar where sort of a local announcement at a time really ref reflecting the community-based local feel of Ontario health teams and not wa and wanting to give the opportunity for local communities to share in the and the good news before uh, disclosing all teams that were successful through this process. So that's ongoing over the next couple of weeks. Uh, so hopefully an announcement may be coming to a community near you. Um, uh, 41 teams in development, they've all been given uh, an opportunity to demonstrate uh, 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 their readiness to proceed to the next stage. And they've been asked to um, prepare progress reports that are coming into the ministry shortly. And then uh, the, the next round of teams will also be progressing as well. Again, no is not the answer. We have incredible momentum across the province on this initiative, and we want that to keep moving no matter what of these categories uh, communities fall into. Um, before I close off, uh, I think just some general topics about what we're seeing. Uh, tremendous engagement of patients and families. Every self-assessment, every full application that we've seen has very deep engagement of patients and families in the work through co-design strategies, not an afterthought, which is amazing. Uh, new partnerships, the amount of partnerships identified in these documents that we're seeing span the spectrum, not, not just our traditional healthcare partners, but engagement of social services and municipalities uh, and everyone in between. So pretty impressive partnerships. And the Ontario Health Team model is very much grounded in these partnerships being developed. Um, if this were easy, it would have been done already. And so we see a lot of identifying barriers and challenges. And our commitment to Ontario Health Teams is to work uh, to, to remove some of those barriers and the challenges, be them legislative or policies or uh, what have you, uh, and you see some of the changes with our digital health is a way of uh, digital health strategy is a way of um, uh, a, a one example of addressing some of the barriers that we've seen through this process. Um, uh, engaging frontline providers is also an area that we've seen a key theme and uh, some of the better applications that we reviewed, you can just tell that there've been some deep engagement of frontline healthcare providers in identifying what the problem is, but more importantly, identifying the solutions to better integrate care. Um, and then I think I'll just maybe skip that slide in the interest of time and just uh, go on to the last slide, which is really about staying engaged. Uh, Ontario health, te health teams can't be Ontario health teams without a strong committed provider network behind them. And I would say to the, to the, the nursing profession, uh, I think my experience has been in my work in primary care and elsewhere that you are often the, the thread that is woven in between care settings and uh, are very much interacting with patients day in and day out. And so staying engaged, getting engaged is a key message that I want to leave you with today because uh, I think the, accept, the success of Ontario Health Teams is very much going to be based in the, in the real life experience that you have caring for patients, working with colleague providers, and we really can't make these a success without your help. So I probably went over my time today, but no, I wanted to thank no. everyone for your attention and uh, for, um, for the work that you have done and the work you will do to make this initiative a success. Thank you. Thank you so much, Phil. And uh, just to remind people, the webinar goes till 3.30. Uh, my colleagues to my left are about 20 minutes presentation. I will be even shorter. So I wonder if we first entertain questions that are already waiting for you, if people promise not to leave. Um, so how about this? We will take two questions, the first two that you got, and then we will leave the others to the end so that we interject with questions from people. If you are okay, Olivia, please read us the first two questions. So the first question is, what is the blueprint of the digital strategy, priorities, et cetera? Um, good question. Um, I, I would say uh, I'm not probably the expert on this. I would say there's a couple of comments I would make. One is um, the general blueprint of the digital strategy, a key element of that is supporting Ontario health teams to succeed. 
Uh, so sometimes there are strategies uh, that go this way and other strategies that go that way. And uh, unfortunately, they are not as connected as they should be. That's not the case with, with our work on digital, that a key element of the strategy, I would say two things. One is removing some of the legislative barriers that have often been cited around privacy, around circles of care uh, that, that we've heard for years. And so a key element of enabling Ontario health teams is to address some of those legislative and policy barriers that has stood in the way of sharing information for the purpose of a more integrated care experience for, for patients. So that's a key element to support Ontario health teams, getting those annoyances out of the way so we can get on with integrating care for patients. I think another key element of the blueprint is patient facing digital and some support to advance that. Uh, some of our survey work shows that about 4% of Ontarians are able to uh, access services through a digital mechanism, which in, in this day and age, given that we do all of our banking and pretty much everything online, uh, I think that uh, you know, patience is wearing thin around not having more options available. And so an element of the blueprint is really uh, incenting, making more available and supporting provincially um, innovative patient facing uh, digital solutions that can really uh, uh, impact the experience that patients are having with their healthcare system. So those are two highlights. I think we could probably come back. I can work with my colleague, Greg Hine, who's the uh, assistant deputy minister responsible for digital to maybe come back and speak a bit more intelligently about all that he has planned for digital. But I think a key point is that the work on digital and our work on Ontario health teams is very much interconnected. So that will be fantastic for the future, for the next webinar, probably. But for not being an expert on it, that was pretty good. Thank you. Anyway, I listen. I, I am a good two listener. Questions in one. So okay. That was great. Um, and so I, she will sneak a third so one. I'm going to, sure. Yes, I'm Happy a third to. one. In order to end hallway medicine, it will healthcare. be healthcare. Yes, I'm just reading. Yeah, I am just healthcare. correcting the person it that wrote. It will be um, important to enhance the ability of nurses in the community to manage these patients. Can you describe some ways you have um, engaged with and support community nurses with this change? Really, uh, I would say, I mean, first of all, amazing question, thank you. And I think we would absolutely agree that the, the solution to hallway healthcare is not only found within the walls of a hospital, that it's very much uh, needs deep engagement within the community uh, to keep people supported at home in their primary care settings before they have to go to the hospital. And if they do have to go to the hospital, then supported after they transition out of the hospital. Um, I would say that uh, there's, there's a couple of ways in which community-based uh, providers have been engaged in efforts to end hallway health care. One is some innovative models that have been rolling out on a smaller scale for now, but we may see more of coming forward. And that is what we call transitional care models. Uh, South Lake at Home is probably a really good example where um, uh, hospitals in partnership with home care and primary care providers are, are developing this sort of transition model between a hospital and discharging someone to home that enables people to gradually uh, uh, get the support they need in order to, uh, over the longer term, be uh, supported as they transition to home. I think what often happens is discharge happens perhaps too quickly and uh, the transition goes immediately to the home. The supports are not there in place and so you see a readmission back to hospital and the cycle continues. And so some of these local transitional care models really helps to bring hospital-based and community-based providers together uh, to work as part of that coordinated team to make sure those patients are well supported in the community. I think the other example, selfishly, is the Ontario health team model. At, at a larger scale, and although I think it might take a bit more time for um, the, the uh, implementation plans to fully come online, but really Ontario health teams are about bringing hospital-based providers, community-based providers, and a whole other uh, a series of uh, organizations and providers within a collaborative care model designed for many things, again, tackling some of the upstream 
reasons why people are being admitted to, to hospital in the first place, as well as some of those downstream transition issues about stitching providers within the continuum better, better together. Uh, and so the government's been pretty clear that ending hallway health care is a significant priority for them. I personally don't think there's one single magic bullet that's going to solve all of our problems. But I think through innovative models like we're seeing at South Lake and other parts of the province around thinking differently about how we transition uh, patients, you know, from acute care settings in the community, but also thinking differently about how we prevent them from getting into the hospital in the first place. I think are all fair game because it is going to take uh, it's going to take a village to solve this problem and not a single silver bullet. So thank you again for the question. So your answers brought a bunch of more questions which I have here, but they will wait for a bit. Um, because Glad that people not, are listening. Because so that's if, good. That they're listening <laughs> and, and lots of more people are joining. So Great. here you go. Uh, so uh, Phil, it's interesting because. Uh, you and I didn't speak about the presentation before, but not surprisingly, uh, there are some overlaps, which is a good thing because it shows that the uh, blueprint that the government put forward with the RFP at the beginning is really driving the agenda. And with that, I must say that I have been, as Phil knows, involved in the health system for uh, over well over two decades here at RNAO, trying to push agendas pretty similar to what's happening now. And I must say that this one is even better. Great. Uh, and I say it with honesty because when we put ECHO uh, 1.0 into 12 and then ECHO 2.0 into 14, and you will see the next one uh, soon to be released, uh, we were really looking at integrated health systems and the only piece perhaps uh, that we will still be pushing for is that more and more be tilted to community care, primary care, etc. Uh, but with that said, uh, the level of excitement that I have seen uh, within um, health sectors, multiple health sectors, uh, healthcare providers, uh, is uh, really second to none from all the initiatives that we have been involved at Arena. So. Uh, bring that back to government because, well, uh, and the minister is aware of that. I shared that this morning with her uh, again, uh, because we know that uh, you are working very hard, all of you. We are too, by extension. Uh, but it's good to hear that it's resonating, that people are excited, that you are not uh, proposing to put uh, breaks um, you know, with announcement today, for example, of 24 from 30, that you are not putting breaks on the other six, who, who, whoever they are, uh, that is all about continuing to improve and continue to move everybody forward because the goodwill is there, the enthusiasm is there, and it's very important that we continue to nurture that enthusiasm. With that being said, is that we, uh, first by a request from one of the OHDs, so the credit goes to the Northwestern Toronto OHD that uh, said to us, we want to extend the work of that we are doing with BPSOs to the entire OHD, how we go about do that. And I said, well, let's think about that together. And that's from where the, the idea of the BPSO spotlight for Ontario health teams came about. Then came Irene from, um, uh, Michael Garron, that they wanted to join the BPSO movement. And that's when we said, well, then maybe you extend it. And the third credit uh, goes for John Lavis, uh, that they, funny enough, wanted us to change the name BPSO HD to call it Integrated Health Systems of Care. And I said, well, BPSOs are known around the world. Like we have a thousand <laughs> organizations. Uh, 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 we can't change that but that's where the tagline comes and it's very important. So we will be sharing a bit now on what is this BPSO uh, OHT, uh, what are BPSOs in general and what is BPSO OHT and how is it that we respond to actually the quadruple aim. Uh, so the, the goal of the BPSOs in general is to optimize patient outcomes through evidence-based practice and robust staff engagement. This is not new. We have done it with uh, organizations directly working with us. 
Uh, we have 550 in Ontario alone, a thousand uh, around the world. And interestingly enough, we, had done, we have done it with integrated systems of care outside of Canada, but not in Canada. So it is the richness of applying knowledge, you know, from global to local and local to global, that really is so exciting to us. And to see this moving here in Ontario, it's just music to our ears. Uh, even more so, that is not only health system, not only healthcare system, it is all about health system, right? Even that in many of them, we have actually uh, organizations that have nothing to do with healthcare and are part of the BPSOHD. So it has been a, a tremendous journey. And um, if we go to the next slide, we will tell you a bit uh, of the organizations that we selected from our end out of the 30 original ones, the four that we are working with directly. And those are separate agreements that are part of the OHT agreement, but focus on specific issues related to evidence uptake and sustainability, our guidelines, and also robust up engagement from the middle layer of management to the really point of care, whether those are regulated, unregulated, nursing, other professions, etc. So the four that uh, we selected is Northwestern Toronto HD, East Toronto Health Partners, South Lake Community, and Ottawa East Health Team. And then there are several others on the pie waiting. And uh, we did have a good conversation with, um, with people at the ministry and we will see where we take that because Otherwise, my team will fire me, <laughs> and I certainly don't want that. I want to see how this evolves, so that's one good reason why I don't want to. Uh, so, in terms of how this fits with the quadruple aim, which for us is not new, because as you said before, we have been working with guidelines also on work environment, we have been working with clinical guidelines, and the issue of the quadruple aim uh, we, we were critical of the triple aim actually at the time saying nothing of this can happen if you don't have engaged staff that does meaningful work that they feel that they are actually contributed to outcomes, not only to cost. So with that in mind, uh, each OHD that engages with RNO as BPSO OHD, meaning this is the OHD, within that is the BPSO OHD is part of uh, has two mandatory guidelines that they need to update. One is the person and family-centered care, and the second is transitions of care. Transitions of care to uh, Marjorie's uh, pleasure actually was requested at the time by the LINS. So transitions of care is a BPD that as we speak, we will start to do the next edition of it. And the OHTs that are working with us will be part of developing the a second edition of Transitions of Care. Then each one of the OHDs, in addition to those two mandatory guidelines, will select two additional guidelines that are uh, pertinent for the type of priorities that they have within their OHD and within the populations that they serve. Uh, the uh, East Toronto partners, uh, for now, uh, have well let me tell you let me tell you actually about the northwest that are the ones that started before the northwest uh, northwestern toronto partners oht they chose in addition to the two mandatory of person and family center care and transitions in care they chose uh, false prevention and a pressure injuries prevention which I want to build on that and then those that are in primary care and mental health and addictions, instead of the pressure is injury prevention, they chose substance use. And I want to mention what you spoke about uh, the value proposition, right? Because we often say at RNO uh, that there is nothing to be ashamed of actually decreasing cost. If the decreasing cost comes, out of exactly the two things, evidence-based practice, so better practice, less falls, less injuries after a fall, less pressure injuries, etc., and out of robust staff engagement, and therefore you have less sick time usually, less turnover, etc., etc., and better care. And in fact, there is a lot to be proud about that. 
So we don't shy away ever from the reducing cost as long as it's in the right way. And this approach uh, to us has been shown to be the right way. In fact, was Monfort, one of the first ones that said to us, you know, we have less sick time now. Mm -hmm. Well, not surprising. If staff are engaged, if they feel that they're doing a meaningful contribution to patient outcomes, they come to work when you have a headache. You don't stay, right? I mean, it, 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 yeah. a lot has to do with what's our work environment on how we feel about our own health. And then the um, colleagues at East Toronto Health Partners, PPSOHD, will be sharing what they are selecting and what, where we are in the process. And I'm going to pass the mic to you. No, it doesn't no, work. So <laughs> you are going to come. No, 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 we'll be able to articulate. Can you? Yeah. We'll Let me move this here. We'll speak nice and loud. Very good. So first, I think will be um, you will be presenting, yeah. Kathleen. Mm -hmm. So we will first have Kathleen Foley uh, from South Riverdale Community Health Center. She is the director of quality improvement and evaluation. She will be presenting, followed by, correct? Okay. Uh, Lindsay Martinique, and yes, it's the same person as in the picture. <laughs> yes. Uh, director of Interprofessional Practice, and this is something important to remember. The BPSOHT model applies to everybody, is for the entire interprofessional team, as well as for regulated and unregulated staff. And then is Catherine Nicol uh, from BHA Home Healthcare. She's the Vice President Quality Best Practice, Research and Education, and CNE, and actually, uh, Catherine is already in the journey of PPSO. All the others are new in the journey of PPSO, and that is important to mention because it will be a, an interesting journey where we will be moving all of us together. All yours, uh, Catherine. Thank you, Graham, and um, sorry, Phil, and, uh, and uh, Doris. Doris, sorry. No yeah, we, the, uh, the East Toronto Health Partners are really excited about this. I think, I think if you collectively count up the number of years that all of us in this, in this lineup have uh, worked in the healthcare system, it's uh, probably well over, well, in my case, I'm over 25 years. So I think what's happening in the healthcare system right now is really, really exciting. And I, for one, have worked in the East End of uh, Toronto uh, in the healthcare industry for, for over 25 years. So seeing this journey evolve and seeing the, the systems evolve has been really exciting. And where we're at right now, I think is really, really important. What you see up on the screen right now is, is the, uh, the, the, um, our visual for these Toronto Health Partners, which brings together the five organizations that um, are the foundation plus our newest partner, which is the East Toronto Family Health Practice Network. I'll talk a little bit about them in a minute. Um, and this partnership comes out of, well, I mean, one of the things that we all as a community now in the East Toronto Health Partners talk about is the work that we do in this area only goes as fast as the speed of trust. But one of the things within the organizations that we've all worked in is that we have 25 year old history of all working collectively together in the East End of Toronto in terms of delivering services and programs and working collectively to improve the impact of, uh, impact of health for, for clients and community. Um, so the partnerships or the CEOs from the five organizations who are the key anchor partners started working about two years ago to do the to do the work in looking at integrated care and models of integrated care for our community. Um, and we then as the anchor partners are also then responsible for our engaged partners. So for instance, at the CHC level, what we're there to do is that we represent all the CHCs who are in the East End of Toronto. So our job is to work with those guys um, to, to look at how we collectively as a sector then work at a systems level. So that's been really, I think, a very important way of us kind of really building that system out, um, out and in, um, in terms of the work that we do. Um, one of the key um, areas that we are quite proud of in the, in the East End of Toronto is not only how the model of a partnership has evolved and developed and will continue to evolve and, do, and develop, but is also the work of the East Toronto Family, Primary, Family Practice Network. So we think that this is the first in the province, um, which is a network that represents um, um, the, the voice of family physicians in our community. Um, it represents at this point in time, 70% of the physicians in the community um, with over 190 physicians already signed up. 
Um, and those physicians represent a all of the models of care from solo physicians to fix, post, whatever, and also community uh, physicians working in community health centers, which I think is really, really important too. Um, I think that's probably like kind of a good summary of, of, the, of, of the actual model and how, and how we are actually working in, in the East End of the city. Okay, so I'm uh, representing and thrilled to be representing can they hear? the, uh, I think, can you hear me yeah. okay? Yeah, I'm thrilled to be representing the, uh, the hospital arm of, uh, of our group here uh, for Michael Garrett Hospital. And even more so, I'm also thrilled to be participating in this as probably the non-nurse of the table. Uh, so, oh, actually, no, no, no. <laughs> we have to. <laughs> uh, so I really, I'm very, very excited to be able to bring the interprofessional lens to all of this work and really to be able to, to ground the work at Michael Guerin in that, uh, in that lens and in that, in that uh, frame. So Michael Guerin's been looking at this work for quite some time, and I think right now the timing is is great. Um, and much to your your points is that we've got a great group together now and partners in East Toronto who are really ready to engage in this work and, and really bring it forward. So, from a Michael Health or uh, sorry a Michael Guerin perspective, we are going to be working very very significantly with a huge focus over the next few years on practice excellence as well as frontline interprofessional staff engagement. And if we listen to Doris's um, description of the goals of uh, BPSO, this really aligns beautifully with, uh, with the goals. So all of this, of course, with the underpinning of person and family-centered care, including things like co-design and the patient experience really at the forefront. So we'll speak a little bit about this more when we talk about our next steps and the things that we're, we're doing from here in our timelines. But uh, Michael Guerin is also thrilled to be hosting the champion training coming up uh, towards the end of February at, uh, at the organization really to spark and ignite this work. So we're really thrilled at that. And, and ultimately just very, very excited overall to be part of this really great work in East Toronto. Great. Great, okay, so over to me. Um, so VHA has actually been a best practice spotlight organization uh, since 2015. We started our journey in 2012. Uh, got our designation in 2015 and have been through two cycles since then and are just on our our uh, our current cycle which is 2019 to 2021 so we've actually implemented six best, uh, best practice guidelines over that time and are sustaining those right now and uh, we have two more that we'll be implementing over the next two years so i think that from our perspective we're delighted to be part of of course the east Toronto health partners but also so thrilled that the, um, the BPSO program or framework is the one that's going to be used to drive the clinical quality uh, agenda for the Ontario Health Team. And, and our hope really is that with our experience, we can um, do as much as we possibly can to help the other organizations along, whether it be mentorship or cheering or even uh, sharing resources. That's, uh, we really hope we'd be able to do that. Um, so the foundational BPGs that, um, that we're going to be taking on, as Doris mentioned, are the person and family centered care and care transitions. And um, we're going to be implementing uh, PFCC in uh, year one. So this one is the one that we're going to kick off almost right away. And so with the training in February, we'll be focusing in on making sure we have people who will be engaged in this work at that training. And then in year two, we'll be focusing in on care transitions. So that'll be the next one coming up. Um, as far as choosing the others, we actually ha had the beginnings of the conversation today at our meeting, but we haven't actually landed on what those are. Um, we feel it's really important to explore whether we're going to have the same or whether we're going to do what um, uh, Northwestern Ontario Health Team has done and, and maybe have one the same and one different. But what we want to make sure is that they're relevant across all of the partners <laughs> and that they reflect our three priority populations that the East Toronto Health Partners has chosen to focus in on. And those are seniors with chronic disease and their caregivers, youth mental health and wellness, and adult substance abuse and health. And so we wanna make sure that whatever we choose um, is relevant to those. So next slide is just um, what we hope to accomplish um, in the BPSO OHT. And I think that I'm just gonna read out what, uh, what we collaboratively put together in this slide only about an hour and a half ago is that anchor and engage partners and clients and families collaborate to implement best practice guidelines and build, it, build an integrated system in East, East Toronto, which is really a system that doesn't have discharges. So getting rid of the D word, as we've heard other <laughs> OHTs talk about. Um, 
robust interdisciplinary team engagement. And I think that we've talked about um, uh, multi-professional or, or interprofessional, but for home care, it's really important that we talk about the inclusion of regulated and unregulated care providers because the core group and the salt of the earth and what really keeps people at home is personal support workers. Um, evidence uptake and sustainability for improved patient clinical and health outcomes. Uh, documenting the impact of this work on improving care and I think that's one of the greatest things about using the BPSO program is um, the focus on documentation and analysis and the ability to do that within the team and maybe across other OHTs is going to be very powerful and then finally spreading and sharing creative strategies and their impact on care so that's what we hope to accomplish as a group Thank you, Kathleen. does it need to do the progress today sure. So <clears throat> in terms of progress to date then and next steps, we've got the, um, the anchor partners across the all, or all of our anchor organizations have signed the agreement with RNAO to become uh, best practice uh, BPSO organizations. And I have to say to echo my colleagues here, for us it's really exciting because for us this is something new, but I think it's something that we feel um, I mean, with our with our partners, but co and collectively, we have a lot to offer in this space, and a lot to learn from each other in this space. Also, I'm also just speaking personally here. Also, really excited about the opportunity to engage clients and caregivers in this process. I think that there's huge learnings in that space to bring us all together collectively as well. So that's my kind of my two bits in in terms of kind of adding to some of the work. Mm -hmm. um, we've established the initial in infrastructure to guide us through this work. And as we've said, we have the short list of guidelines that we'll begin to discuss and figure out what's best for us as, 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 as the East, in the East End of Toronto to really help us leverage the particular priority one pro priorities, priority one populations. And we have begun uh, looking at the next steps in terms of gaps analysis. We've got a date for our two day in person champions training. And again, in those champions training is we're looking at the kind of really reflecting the teams that we work with. So it's an opportunity as it's for organizations to learn, but then cross organizationally and as a system, which I think is really, really exciting. And um, we'll begin to look at then implementing uh, person and family centered care across uh, the East End of, of uh, Toronto, which uh, I think will be Look, I'm really looking forward to working and learning from everyone. That's fantastic. So just to give you from an RNO perspective, the next steps with these four OHDs, and we said we will take four on each one of the rounds, including in the innovators. Uh, so first of all, uh, given that two of the guidelines are mandatory for any OHD, down the line what you will see, we do knowledge exchange every month uh, virtual. Uh, what you will see is that not only the PFCC person family center care in this OHD will be meeting, but they will be meeting with the champions on the other OHDs on the same topic and learning and collaborating one with the other. Um, we also will be measuring and creating walls around each OHD so they can share their knowledge, their growth, their areas where they need to uh, focus more. At RNO, we have an assigned coach to each OHD. Uh, it's not the only thing that that person does. Uh, in fact, for this OHD, it's me, so here you go. <laughs> for sure, it's not the only thing I do. Uh, but we do take this work and have all along with all the organizations, we have taken it very seriously. So we do serve as coaches, uh, as well as we learn in the process what, what else should we do with the program? They learn from one another, we learn together, and we also serve to coach. And we do review the reports. Uh, they have reports twice a year, uh, based on the data, both in the data on Enquire, which is quantitative, and the data in the MyBPSO. And we do actually review the reports with them so that they can continue to grow on the areas where it's a need and be cheered on the areas that they're doing uh, extremely well. Uh, so more to come, there is an event that we will be doing, I don't recall the date or the timeline for that, but that we will be doing with all the OHDs on Knowledge Exchange. Fall. Fall. Fall of 2020. And so that event, uh, one day will be only for the OHDs that are already working with us, and the second day will be open to all OHDs so we can share our learnings and continue to share uh, also the energy that this is creating. 
Uh, when you look at uh, change and the way that RNO has led this program both here at home and internationally, we do use two frameworks, as I shared with the team uh, past time and, and today again. We do use the knowledge to action framework, which is a very systematic way of looking at what are you doing in practice now and what you ought to be doing based on the evidence. Uh, that's one framework. So we share, we learn there about gap analysis, stakeholder engagement, et cetera. Uh, and we also use social movement action. And that's work that now we are expanding with CPSI and that we will be sharing actually with all the OHDs uh, for them to be able to gain from that. With that, let's open for questions and then we can do some closing. I know that you have more questions mm -hmm. for Phil and for others, so please go ahead. Okay, so the first question is what measures are going to be tracked to monitor improved work life for providers and will this information be made public? Will the measures look at specific areas, for example, hospitals, community, or long-term care? So I think that's getting at the provider experience measure. So let me talk from the point of view of RNO, yeah. and let's see if there are synergies then, because this will be interesting if not to align the synergies that, that we are doing. So in terms of um, robust staff engagement, right? When we are saying that we are going to deliver, that we do deliver on two things. One is the evidence-based practice, the other is robust staff engagement. We will be looking at issues as end goal, as sick time. We absolutely will be looking at issues of uh, turnover and some other parameters just to see the end impact of the robust staff engagement in addition to providing a better and better care. So those are two indicators that we are seriously looking at. And, and I think, uh, thanks for the question. I think those are um, you know, certainly indicators that you uh, and have been used to measure and monitor um, provider experience. I'm also a firm believer if you, if you wanna know how we're doing is you ask the question. And so there are things called, uh, you know, PREMS, paid, uh, Provider Reported Experience Measures, survey-based. And so I think a combination of some of the uh, indicators that Doris had mentioned, as well as key questions, and we don't have to start anew in Ontario, this has been done. Uh, and, you know, what are the markers and the making of um, good provider experience and how can you get at the core of that? There are, there, are, there are measures like engagement. Do you feel engaged in the change process? Do you have opportunities to uh, influence and, and have your voice heard? Um, you know, there are also questions about uh, the extent to which uh, you feel supported in your role as this is, you know. So I think there's a variety of tools that we can look both to develop in Ontario as well as draw from elsewhere about how we can measure and monitor that. Um, and uh, I think it's a key element of the measurement framework that we'll be working at, uh, looking at. And uh, those are probably just a, a few examples of the specifics of where we would focus on. So just before you move to the next one, that's excellent. A couple of points uh, to, um, to share is that all the revised or next edition guidelines of RNAO, uh, as well as new guidelines, have frames and prompts. So that will be important Great. to see how we connect on that. And the second piece is the work that we're doing with uh, Professor Janet Squires from uh, from uh, University of Ottawa on the issue of identifying this exactly this type of indicators and analysis that we have done through the MyBPSO, which probably we should be sharing with you just yeah. to, to ensure that we are uh, on the same page, but that's excellent. So you were talking more about the process indicators versus the, the um, outcome indicators of staff engagement, which both we are looking at both. We are also looking at structure indicators um, on staff engagement. So that's great. Yeah. Next question. How does being part of an OHT impact patient choice of provider? Can a patient get stuck in one team and then be unable to seek a second opinion? I think that is a very important question. And I think the clearest answer I can provide is, is, is that patient choice of provider remains paramount. Okay, that this is about improving care and, and, and smoothing out the pathway for a particular patient. It's not about disrupting their access to care. 
And so there are some there are some intricacies of the model about how you attribute a group of patients to a particular o uh, Ontario health team. You know, a lot of that is based on following existing access patterns that patients have in Ontario that we're able to uh, uncover through our looking at anonymous data through the OHIP database. Um, but I think the short answer is this is not about disrupting access to care, it's about improving it. Great, thank you. What is the plan for current Lynn staff? Um, do you want to take on this one? <laughs> Oh, I can, I can, I can try. I, I don't know what it is. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, I think it's, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, you know, a lot of changes happening in, in our healthcare system today. Um, you know, the, the creation of Ontario Health as a, a, a um, consolidation of a, of a range of provincial oversight agencies is very much related, I think, to the question about the, the Lynn staff. I think there, there are, um, uh, you know, as, as part of the legislation uh, that creates Ontario Health, the idea that, that the, the teams within the LINs providing those traditional LIN functions around oversight and planning, I think that is a function that Ontario Health will, will play uh, in the future. And then there is the work that um, is currently done with respect to supporting home, home and community care as well as long-term care home placement. Um, the, the message that the minister has been very clear uh, in that regard has been uh, no disruption to uh, frontline services associated with this transition. And uh, I think for uh, uh, the important services that uh, care coordinators, long-term care placement advisors and others play, you know, they serve about 700,000 Ontarians uh, every year, many of whom are senior and, you know, need a lot of support. Home care has about 100,000 visits per day. So it is a very busy, busy and very important sector. And again, this transition and this transformation is about better supporting providers and better supporting patients, not to disrupt the services. Can I just add a piece yes. of that? Just uh, bring it to the level of the East Toronto Health Partners. Um, one of the things that's, that's been really fantastic for this group is the involvement of the Toronto Central Inn. And I think that we have had representation at a, um, at a, from a number of people that have um, that are are working with the Lynn, helping the the Toronto the East Toronto Health Partners, and continue to even here today. So I think that that that's something. I know that's not consistent. There's different approaches across the board with the OHTs, but certainly for our um, team, it has been um, instrumental to have their expertise and support at the table. So just to I mean as a means of an update though. I think it's important to share that it already is public that there will be five regional offices, yeah. uh, that the lean structure is changing. Like I wouldn't want this, the people attending today thinking that all remains exactly the same. Would you comment on that? Um, yeah, and I think a lot of, a lot of uh, thank you Doris, I think a lot of the, the work is ongoing. Yeah. So it's very hard to be definitive as we're, you know, right now. Um, there has been discussion about a regional footprint for Ontario Health. You know, the location of the offices and things like that at end state are not determined yet, but we are in the process of a, of a change in how Ontario configures uh, oversight and some of the other functions that Ontario Health will perform, both in terms of the centrally performed functions, as well as the regional arms. So uh, certainly I think we're seeing a shift beyond the current model uh, and we're just very much in the middle of that right now. So, uh, you know, I think the important message that our minister has been clear about is that while we're undertaking this reform and as we're undertaking this change, that the importance of stable frontline services that people can rely on is of paramount importance. Thank you. I have two um, questions, mainly uh, financially related. So one is, um, does the doctor get paid for services when she emails me a follow-up to my appointment? I'll ask that one. And then the other one is, how will the OHT interact with the private sector patient support programs available for patients with chronic disease and autoimmune conditions in which patients seek IV, so this is very specific, but IV biological administration using out-of-pocket funds and or private insurance. So maybe there's sort of a global answer for some of these 
funding. Uh, yeah, I, I would say that in, in the short term, um, there is some building to do before we get to any significant alterations of how funding is organized. And I think we're learning that, uh, you know, that, that what takes an OHT and the building blocks and colleagues here uh, can likely add further detail. It's really about building the partnerships and, and, and making those local connections first, which is not, is not the norm in all communities across the province in terms of uh, close relationships among healthcare providers. And so we're seeing that as a key early focus as, as a building block to, to build Ontario health teams. I think our experience is if you start off with funding and changing around funding, uh, you know, you, it's too much too quick and you have to, I think, develop these models in more of a gradual, gradual way, focusing first with partnerships before you get into any, any discussions about, about altering funding or changing, uh, changing the way providers are funded or patients accessing services. So I, I, I sorry, that's a, it's a non-answer to the question. <laughs> the, the real answer is I don't know the answer sure. to those questions, you, but yes, I would say it. that uh, it's still early days before we, uh, I think, move forward with significant funding changes is through the OHD initiative. Great, thank you. I have, it looks like two or three more questions. Go for it. Okay, so the next question is about um, people who are displaced, homeless, underhoused, mm. students, people who are not stationary. So how will OHDs care for those Ontarians? I don't, I don't know if, if, if you've been at local planning tables, I think uh, you we can have speak a more to some of that stuff. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, we've seen some really, really um, interesting work already happen in a very short period of time within the east, east end of Toronto. Um, I mean, South Riverdale is a community health center, does a lot of work with individuals who are substance using. And I know within our community, we, what we've been able to do is look at the, the data that was at the Lynn level around issues in areas where there was a great deal of need. Um, as it related to um, uh, particularly emergency use in, um, of the, at the hospital end. And so we now have a specific planning table in a specific community looking at leveraging how you use a hub-based model, bringing together ourselves and ourselves as community health centers, bringing together social services, bringing together folks who are not necessarily providing services within the traditional health um, uh, env envelope of funding to look at how we better service that one particular community and, and you know, provide better access to eMERGE when needed. Um, and then, but also then to keep people in the community. So that will be about harm reduction services, it'll be about health promotion, it'll also be about issues like um, food security and working with uh, other community partners we have. So, so some, some real early um, examples of where we can kind of collectively leverage the work that we have. And I mean, and I see again, the work that we're going to do in terms of best practice. I mean, one of the things that we talked about this morning is in that environment, what is the rule? What is the, um, is there an opportunity for the best practice guidelines around substance use and leveraging it there as we build, build and evolve these community partnerships uh, to better serve the community and also within involved in that work at the, that, at the center level within that hub based model as a place for individuals who themselves have had an experience of mental health and substance use being actually involved in the co-design the service so i think that the, that that's and and i mean i think what is really really interesting everybody talks about this being a low rules environment but within that low rules environment it's really allowing it to open the door for some creativity in terms of being able to really address some of the the really sticky and, and difficult and challenging issues within the healthcare system so i think it's all quite quite exciting uh, for us to be able to kind of get in there and work collectively from the hospital perspective i think one of the things that we see a lot with particular that that population specifically and I, I go to sort of the folks with no fixed address mm. um, folks who struggle with housing they str and, and we know we have a housing crunch and we don't have enough mm. to go around um, and, and you know I won't say too much more on that but um, I think one of the things that the uh, the OHT really is going to help from the transitions perspective if we really truly live that vision of no discharge then it will eliminate the barriers that those those folks face who have either no fixed address or who have no fixed address with substance issues mm -hmm. and mental health concerns and 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 chronic diseases on top of yeah. them right so from a hospital perspective engaging in this work and really being more intentional about how we remove um remove discharges really and, and go to just sort of a seamless system that will be of huge benefit to 
to the flow within the uh, within the system, and also more importantly, the access for patients uh, who have these kinds of uh, you know, social determinant yeah. barriers, uh, and that'll certainly help us be able to put the right folks um, through the emerge into the beds who really really need the acute care is what we do best. Yeah. And I think that in that area also is the two things that I want to mention. One is the importance of the work of all disciplines and a nursing in particular and MPs in particular, uh, because I think the capacity of MPs to, to actually reach out to some of those post populations uh, is tremendous. Uh, I also want to comment on how much of this has happened before the OHDs mm. or has not, because people, um, especially at the beginning, less now, but at the beginning, why is it that we need this force upon us? Why is it that, and I said, well, because we never really did it enough before. And if sometimes we are not pushed or incentivized to do something, it's not happening, right? So I do want to take uh, a parenthesis on the comment I just made, because I was uh, speaking with uh, Sarah Downey at uh, uh, Michael Guerin, and I was actually tremendously impressed on the um, investment that the hospital has done in the last three years with a few of the surpluses into community programs that support uh, co-design by people with substance use or people uh, that are less fortunate. Um, so still though, that's different than what at least I am seeing now. And at least with the four OHDs that we are working, the level of engagement, the level of participation the level of excitement of wanting to do together, good. Um, I have not seen it before. I don't know about you, Phil. You have been involved. It's new territory. Time. There's not right. a lot of enthusiasm. It's great. Yeah, and I think that's a message for you to take back to the government. And I know they know it. And I know that um, all of the colleagues involved with you on this, all, all the way up to the minister, also want to keep the enthusiasm and the goodwill, yeah. the goodwill of the teams, the goodwill of the health professionals, I would say also of associations like ours, I think is mm -hmm. very important and it needs to be accounted for and nurtured. Uh, we do have a universal health system. And often I say universal health systems are as good as the people as work mm -hmm. on them. You know, this is not only a government initiative, this is not only a funding initiative, that for sure, but this is also an initiative that we either all of us will make it work and succeed and be a shining star for maybe other jurisdictions that have said, oh, but we have done integrated health systems before. Well, this is a bit of a different model, at least I feel that way. So more questions? Yes, there are some more questions. I'm going to ask a, a more general one that might have broad application to a lot of the people listening, and then there are a couple of specific ones. So this one is, have there been any conversations about how public health and EMS will be integrated with OHTs? I mean, we, we, I mean, so in the east end of Toronto, we've had EMS part of our um, silos uh, community planning table for, for a long time. So we've already got some existing uh, um, successes and relationships in that area that I think that we'll continue to work on and leverage. I think there's still some work to be, more work to be done in that area, but I think that, you know, certainly we've had a history working in that with, um, to collectively together, uh, particularly to address the needs of individuals with the, the most complex issues. Um, so I, I mean, I just see it as another one of those areas where we'll do some ongoing planning and, and development. I don't know if you guys have more to say. I will. So uh, two things. First of all, the government is doing, as we speak, um, consultations in relationship to public health. Uh, we are aware of them and we are uh, involved on them. Um, second, um, the BPSO part of the OHTs that we are involved in two of them, we did involve public health. So on Ottawa East, uh, public health is involved as one of the signatories of the BPSOHT and in South Lake, um, also public health through their chief nurse uh, officer is involved in the OHT, in the BPSOHT. So that's not to say that we couldn't do a similar thing and reach out 
to the public health uh, in Toronto or whatever is your public health unit. I'm assuming it's the Toronto one. Yeah. And the Toronto one, pretty sure, will stay on. So here you go. Uh, it's a safe thing. Uh, I, I, I am not putting a Phil on the spot because he is with the OHDs, not with the public health thing. But it is safe to say that we will not end up with a 35 or 37 uh, public health units that we have currently. And you do need to know that Arenio is supportive and has been supportive of uh, having a lesser number of public health units. And that is simply because of our experience during SARS, H1N1, et cetera. The fact that some of them or, may, or several of them do not have the expertise locally that they require. And that actually, when you look at best practices, you don't have in any jurisdiction the humongous numbers that we have yet. That's not to say that we don't respect their work, we do. That's not to say, not to say that they haven't done good work because they do the best they can under the circumstances, but it is to say that Arenio was supportive when the previous government uh, stated 14 uh, public health units. And in fact, we had back then our president uh, being a member of that task force. Uh, so um, have we received flag for that view uh, on and off? Yes, we have. Do we stand by what we say based on the evidence? Yes, we do. Uh, likely it will not be 14 because that's a previous government. So whether it's 13, 15, 16, 17, 18, 20, uh, but we do say we need to have a lesser number and make sure that they're strong that they are well resourced. We don't, very much like Phil said, you don't tackle um, funding. You first tackle what is it that you want to deliver good to Ontarians. We are saying, please do not decrease the funding because you create instability and you cannot create uh, structural changes at the same time as you create funding changes. So we are saying, keep the funding the way it is uh, just uh, condense it and, uh, and, and have expertise in whichever number public health units will remain in the future. So just wanted you to have the renewal perspective on that. Other questions? We do have other questions and it's 326. So I'll ask this one and then perhaps we can um, wrap, up and, wrap up and bring um, forth those questions in the next webinar yes. or yes. some other way. So this question is, um, how will the RNAO and OHT work with community and private colleges to graduate more and better trained personal support workers to deal with the expected challenges, for example, behavioral support, family dynamics that they may face in the homes? So that's an excellent question. And in fact, at one point, um, I wanted to involve colleges and universities within the VPSOHT model, and then quickly, quickly, quickly um, was um, um, actually dissuaded from that for good reasons. Remember, the VPSOHT model applies to all disciplines. So which colleges, which universities are we going to choose? Uh, furthermore, there are so many. Which ones are we going to take? So much like we did with the BPSO model in general, we are starting with the service organizations and then we will engage the academic institutions. Um, as for the issue of PSWs, um, uh, yes, absolutely, we need more. So do we RNs in this province. We have the lowest RN per population in Canada. I'm not going to go there now, but that's no good news. We just finished a study for OECD uh, by their request comparing the VPSOs that are implementing in Ontario the falls uh, prevention and, and injuries after the fall BPG, comparatively speaking to CIHI data. And all I could say is wow, because comparatively speaking to, uh, BPS, to non VPSOs in Ontario, in long-term care, uh, we're doing significantly better. In fact, the VPSOs that are implementing the pressure, the false prevention BPD are at the equal footing as Alberta and DC, if I remember the jurisdictions, we are the who are the best in terms of falls in the country. Um, and that I said, when I wrote the piece for um, OECD, I said, and that is despite that we have 
the lowest RM per population, and likely also despite that we have the lowest probably caregiver per population in nursing homes in Ontario, comparatively speaking to nursing homes in those other two jurisdictions. So it is something that we are looking um, because um, part, you, we can do all we can to ensure staff engagement and we can do all we can to provide outstanding care. But of course, we need also the providers to do that and the ministry is aware of that. So yes for PSWs and yes for many other health professionals. I was talking today with you actually. Adeline, we were talking about uh, midwives. Mm -hmm. I was sharing that in Chile, 80% of the vaginal deliveries are done by midwives. If you look here in Ontario and in Canada, it's like really insignificant compared to the population of women that likely would like to have their delivery by midwives. So we do need to look at the issue of human resources in the go forward, and I'm sure we will do it together with ministry. I am getting the call from Susan McNeil, who is my right hand uh, on this journey, uh, to let you know that Thursday, January 30th, Thursday, January 30th, it doesn't say at what time, have to, we will establish that. Okay, so Thursday, January 30, we will have the next webinar. And in that webinar, likely we will ask um, your colleague, Rick, probably will be good to come and talk about the blueprint, the blueprint for digital, uh, given the interest of people on that and the importance of knowing that. And then we will give you the update on yet another BPSO thing. Thank you so very much to the many, many of you that joined today. Uh, it is uh, always inspiring uh, to hear my colleagues uh, here. Uh, so to all of you, to uh, Phil and to my colleagues from the uh, East Toronto OHT, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for the participants that had tremendous questions. And I know we left some hanging there we will make sure to bring them as the first questions for the next uh, for the next round in January 30th. Thank you so much and all the very best from all of us. Enjoy the holidays and hopefully you can get a rest so we can continue <laughs> this. What did you say? It's, it's not a, a, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. <laughs> for the marathon, it's okay. not, here you go. Thank you so much. Like the queen? <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, wait. Very good.